Welcome everyone and thank you again for coming to our next uh, part of our social justice uh, series, our part two of our Black male experience. Um, again, my name is Rob Delu, Director of Multicultural Affairs and Interim SSCM uh, Leader at Bristol Community College. Um, and again, today we're going to bring you a, a fantastic program um, as we are building these, um, we're building a linkage between all of our work and continuing to build and understanding how to bridge gaps in retention um, of various students and also showing their experiences through injustices and things that we may not recognize and realize that are happening um, at the secondary educational, early elementary, higher ed, and just in life in general for a lot of our student populations. Um, as, as I said today, uh, this is part two of our workshop on April 1st. Uh -huh. We were uh, we came together and we talked about uh, our first you know part of the black male experiences uh, where Serge Moniz, uh, uh, Dr. Daryl D T Henry, uh, Bobby Bailey, uh, T uh, J Henry, um, also uh, Marcus Christopher and, and Frank Stevenson joined us for part one of the forum, which the program focused on real life experiences of black men from across the local community who spoke about their educational journeys. Um, and as lead and as leaders, um, taking a, a roundtable approach and the panelists, uh, we had a, a great open discussion and, and about conversations and, and, and a variety of topics relating to um, the daily lived experience of, of our black men. This, it was a, a powerful day, it was a great day. A lot of great feedback from this particular, from that event. And, you know, as we are building on the black male experience, this is part two. And there will be part three and so on and so forth as we move um, as we move along throughout the course of our our academic years um, here at Bristol and beyond. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so as you know, um, our previous social justice forums were created uh, from a year ago. Uh, we've already done nine forums plus uh, two fast action um, forums that have been all part of our social justice series. Um, uh, with you know, it started with the um, the, the murder of George Floyd, which really sparked um, our campus, myself, President Douglas, and many others to kind of say, enough is enough. We want to make sure that we are, we wanted to make sure that we are part of the solution and doing things for our community. So that way we are, so that way we show that Bristol stands against hate, um, stands against uh, racism, and, and, and we wanted to be part of that. And, and showing how inclusive we are as a community. After that George Floyd um, conversation, we our next our next uh, forum was on police and criminal justice and how race is impacted within uh, the criminal justice and reform. Then we went into a race and LG, uh, LGBTQ rights. We went, spoke about ed educational inequities in higher education and secondary education. We went, we spoke about race within the intersections of uh, disability and also in mental health. We spoke about immigration rights, and we also spoke about gender rights in, in, in our previous forums. And then what I just mentioned before was our last particular forum, which was on the Black male experience as we, we created a framework, and now we are getting a little bit more intentional in our approaches um, and things that we're doing here at our campus. Next slide, please. In, in, in doing these forums, they have been extremely successful, and I, and I appreciate the attendance and people spending time out of their days to be part of this as we are as we are journeying and it's a lot of tough conversations that that are that take place in this. Um, but in doing so, there has to be ground rules that are set um, in this type of space. It is a safe space. And what I mean by that is no no room for um, hate speech or, or hate conversation. We are here to learn from one another um, in the safe space. We, we are here to ask questions. We are here to listen and we're here to learn and how we can make ourselves a better um, professionals, better people, um, better students, um, better employees, uh, better friends, family, fathers, mothers, whatever it is, just hopefully we can be better by being in the space and spending the time um, doing that. Um, also within the, the space and within our, our ground rules here, a couple of things that we need to, uh, everyone right now is muted you're not able to mute in and, and because the conversations that we will have in, in a couple of minutes here are going to just be between myself and, and the students who are with us. We are going to kind of just um, really just vibe out and have great conversation and talk about the experiences while, while at um, Bristol Community College and beyond. 
and how the, that experience has um, turned out for each of these students. So we want everyone to listen and pay attention. And that's why the chat is not active. And that's why um, the uh, we're not able to unmute because we just want that to be very fluid. After um, we, you know, also within the space, if you, once we get to the Q&A session after at the end here, you're able, if you wanna ask questions and you just, you, you can use your raise your hand function um, or you can say, I have a question or comment within um, you can say you have a question or comment within the chat, because the chat will then reappear and be open for you. If you don't feel comfortable um, speaking in, in this type of a platform in front of everyone and you want to ask a question, you can private message myself or Melissa Rogers the question and we can ask, we can ask it for you, which will be completely confidential and private if you have something that you would like to speak on. Um, other than that, you can also communicate with me during the course of the, um, the, this particular form through the um, private chat feature as well, if you have something that you would like to share or say or direct me to as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a quick agenda of what today looks like. Um, obviously right now I'm doing the intros and then we'll go into our student roundtable discussion. And then we'll have, um, we'll, we'll speak briefly about um, our relationship and engagement building as part of this workshop and where you as a practitioner or as a learner can talk uh, and ask questions about things that really help other um, leaders in education with um, this particular population. And, and you can, you know, feel free to, you know, think about it, engage and ask questions, uh, things that you may have struggled with in the past, bring that to the forefront. Um, and we have some great people on here that will be able to answer those questions, including the students who are going through it as well, who can speak from real life experiences. Next slide. So today is groundbreaking, okay? And, and what I mean by it being groundbreaking is usually forms um, are with, student, with students are pretty much scripted. This is an unscripted form that, it, that has very little preparation in the sense of, I know the individuals we did meet to talk about what this, the form is going to be like, but there's no script behind what, what we're doing here as, as a college or, or in this particular program for our social justice form. What usually you see in these type of forms when we're talking about the experiences of black males or black male success or things that you've seen on uh, any writings or literature on, on, the, on black male retention, usually we see people who have really gone through, the, through, through their journey and they're really at a high pinnacle of their career and they speak about it. Um, this is a little different. These particular students and former students and are professionals and, and, and that are working or are currently still in school, but they're going through this right now in real time. So as we are having this conversation, this is something that's very familiar to them as they are right now finding their way and experiencing things and realizing things um, currently. This is real live data. This is real live information that is happening currently for these individuals. So it's great to get that perspective versus the finished product, which we seem to always get in higher education. So this, is, this format is a little bit different. Um, why are we here? Well, we're here because black male retention across the country is at, a, at, at its all time low. Black males are not being retained higher than their counterparts. Um, it's systems that have been created that were ex not inclusive of um, the black male and the black male experience. So because these systems were created in, in higher ed, it really, you know, it was very, um, holistic and very open to all students. But as you do that and you have that sometimes that design, it doesn't really include others from various different cultures, backgrounds, and identities. And today we're speaking about the Black male experience because of that. So who are these men? These men are their current students, their former students, their, their fathers, uh, their sons. Um, they are married. Uh, they are working men. They are currently doing their education. Um, they're athletes or former athletes as well. Um, a lot of them are very well versed. Uh, uh, some of them are military, currently in the military. Some are artists, musicians, poets. Um, you know, they were club leaders while they were at Bristol. Um, you know, um, they were in, entrenched in a lot of different, a lot of different areas at the at the college at the time. Um, they're professionals. 
um, and then, you know, who are currently going through, through some things. And there are also students who have, who have stopped out and dropped out and came back to college and they've had a lot of adversity in their journey. So what I'm gonna do today is introduce um, our panelists or our students as we develop this conversation. And they're gonna just introduce themselves, say their name and where they're from and talk a little bit about their, who they are and what they're currently doing. And then we'll get into the Q&A. As we go into this Q&A, it will probably be, you know, just for the next, um, for the next 30, 35 minutes, we'll, we'll have our, our conversation as we normally do. Uh, we had a conversation last night that was very organic and fun and, and vibrant. And that's kind of what I want to bring to this um, conversation. It's really much like a barbershop type conversation that we will have, but we're going to, but the topic is going to be on education and our education journeys and how we've seen, um, how we've seen it through our lens. And then um, I will have our, our great leaders in education, Serge Meniz, Dr. Dario D.T. Henry, and Dr. Engen Atase will be, uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about tips and things that have been successful for them in their spaces. And then we will open it up to everyone to have that conversation. And then once we do that, we will um, part and then that will be it. And I'll have some parting uh, discussions for us. And then we move on to the next part of our forum series. So I hope you enjoy this type of workshop um, that is gonna, it's a little different than your traditional uh, workshop or panel um, and it's done purposely because we want it to be as organic as possible um, and we want to have fun with it. So first I'd like to introduce um, our first uh, panelist, uh, Clayton Timmis. Uh, Clayton, could you just please say hello and um, you know where you're from and explain a little bit about yourself and then we'll and then I'll call on to the next person after you're done. That's perfect. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm great. How are you? Can everybody have me walk? Because I'm driving a little bit, so I'm going through the car speaker. So hopefully, everyone can hear me well. JB in here. My name is Clayton <laughs> Timus. Originally, I was born in Cape Verde. You're kind of going in and out, Clayton. So I'm going to come back to you once you get to a better spot. I'm going to go to. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, another student. And I'll come back to you just because I want everybody to be able to hear you. Looks like your, your, your screen may have frozen. So the next uh, student is uh, Dante Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. Whoa, whoa. Can you hear me? So Wait. My first two years at Bristol Community College. First two years. At okay, that's fine. Yep. Okay. <laughs> my name is um, Dante Rodriguez. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. I um. When I was at BCC, I was going to BCC for um special education. I did about. Three years, I was one of the ones that dropped out, came back. But one thing I could say that always bring me back was um, Coach D. Whenever I needed him through that time, like if I needed any questions or any help to get me back into school, he was the one that I looked out to and he helped me every step. Uh, right now, I'm, a, um, I'm an assistant manager at my job. I'm just trying to work, get my own house. So when my son comes, I'm situated. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we'll come back to you. Um, Next is uh, Malik Morris. Malik, could you um, say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Malik Morris. Uh, I'm from Fall River. Uh, I went to BCC in 2019 for one year. I played basketball for that year. Coach D, I was blessed to have Coach D as a coach for his last year. Um, the knowledge he parted on me that year. One thing, yeah, one thing that always brings me back to BCC is Coach D. In just the multicultural center. Sorry, I'm out of breath. I'm at the skate park. <laughs> but, but no, definitely one place I was always just able to be myself, speak my mind, and never be afraid to just like be myself is the multicultural center. And it was backed up every single day. It was in there. So, so I'm here right now today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And you know, are you getting better? We'll, we'll get we'll get into the skating after. I won't I won't delay. Yeah, we'll get it to it later. <laughs> <laughs> um, next will be Malik Charles. Could you say hello, Malik? Hi, how are you guys today? I'm Malik Charles. Um, I attended BCC for one year in 2019, and I played for Coach D. One thing that always brings me back is Coach D and 
the respect that I have for him for always having my back and be able to help me with anything. Even if he didn't know the answer, he would come and find one for me. Um, I live in Taunton. I joined the military. I'm in the Marines right now, as well as attending school. I uh, transferred to UMass Amherst and I'm here right now on track to getting my undergraduate in communications and criminal justice. Thank you so much, Malik, appreciate that. Um, next is uh, Zach Vega. Zach, could you say hello? Having a little difficulty. I'll come back to you, Zach. We'll have you unmute in a second. We'll probably, maybe, yep, you got it. There you go. Oh, can you hear me? Can you yep. hear me now? Yep. All right. Uh, hi, my name is um, Zachary Vega. Sorry, I'm, I'm driving right now. But um, I went to uh, Bristol Community College from 2017 to 2019. Uh, graduated from there. Uh, got a scholarship to uh, play basketball at Roberts Wesleyan up in New York. Um, so right now I'm currently uh, getting my uh, degree and uh, potentially going for my master's at Roberts Wesleyan College and still playing basketball. Thank you so much, um, Zach. Uh, next is uh, John Forts. John. Yeah, what's up? Um, my name is John Forts. I'm actually from uh, New Bedford, Mass. I went to BCC. Um, I graduated in 2019. And um, yeah, man, just Rob was a big help in my life, man. Definitely me. I, I had a tough road, you know, just too much on my plate trying to balance everything out. And he definitely helped me out, man. And I'm blessed, man. I thank him for that. I graduated in 2019. Now I'm just working two jobs. Just bought my first house and I'm just trying to keep going, man. You know, just, just figure it out. But man, yeah, Coach Rob, man, if it wasn't for him, man, probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, Clayton. Yes, can you guys hear me better now? Yeah, we can hear you better. Yep. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, as you guys know me, I'm, my name is Clayton Timas. Uh, I was born and raised in Cape Verde until 2002. Then try, um, came here to live with my father. Attended BCC from uh, 2008, 2010. But actually, I was, you know, one of oh. Rob's um, when they had the first um, basketball at BCC. So I was one of the first players to, um, to play there. Um, and Rob has always been um, like a father figure to me. He's somebody that I could confine to whenever I'm making big life decisions, even until now to this day, uh, somebody I can reach out to every day. So uh, I'm thankful and blessed to have him in my life. Um, now I'm, I'm married, got three beautiful kids, own my own house. I'm currently the branch manager for Centenaire Bank. Um, so that's me in a, in a nutshell. Thank you for having me today, guys. No, thank you so much. And um, we'll go into some introductions of our um, practitioners who will share some tips just uh, real quick. And um, again, the sentiments and the, 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 the heartfelt from, from the fellas, it means a lot. I definitely um, thank you guys. We, we, we're going to talk about your experience with that all. Oh, and TJ is the next one that I need to introduce because he was off camera. I missed him. I'm sorry. TJ, go ahead. Hi, my name is TJ. Um, I'm in my second year at BCC, and I'm a sociology. I'm a liberal arts major with a sociology focus. Um, I'm also a work study for the Multicultural Center, which I started, um, which I started my first year. And the Multicultural Center is just um, re was really just super helpful for me to sort of. Un understand social justice a lot more and also just how to connect with people more hosting events and just having these in-depth discussions about different topics with both Rob, Melissa and other people at the center and um, yeah more than grateful for uh, to be here and to be able to have this discussion again. Well, thank you so much TJ. 
Um, and so let me introduce a couple of our panelists, some, some stars that we have here um, in our local, at Bristol Community College in our local area, um, high schools as well. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Um, Enganatase. Engan, could you say hello? Hello everyone, I'm Engan Atasai. I'm full-time faculty here at Bristol Community College and I uh, coordinate the elementary education program. And now, um, Dr. D.T. Henry. How y'all doing everybody? Dr. D.T. Henry here, our director of TRIO at Bristol Community College. And last but not least, Serge Meniz. Hello everyone, I'm Serge Meniz. I'm a high school shop instructor at Greater New Bedford Volk teaching the diesel services program. I'm also the uh, union co-president, um, father of four. Um, I also wanna give props to Rob as one of my best friends. I know the, the work that you put into um, to coaching, but um, you know people, people think you coach because you love basketball. That's kind of secondary. You coach because you wanna make a difference in the lives of many. And, and today is evidence of that. So great job, brother. Thank you very much. And again, it's, um, it's great to have you all here with us and supporting this. There are many others um, that could um, not be with this conversation, but you know, as we move along, you'll get to meet other individuals as these series start to develop with not just within the, um, this particular um, demographic, but with others as we, uh, as we journey and move, and move forward. So let's begin the Q&A just for a little while and we'll just have a discussion. And again, um, everything's not gonna be uh, you know, talked about today and there are gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be left on the table that we are you know, gonna think about, oh man, I would love to hear more about that. But that's why these series are important as we continue to build our knowledge and experience um, as, you know, as leaders in, in our community. So, you know, I'm just gonna kind of keep it, leave it open to any one of the, any one of the fellows who would like to join in. And I wanna, you know, take away, um, you know, I, the takeaway I want from this first question is, what is the hardest part of, attending school at a predominantly white institution, whether it be at Bristol or other, um, whether it be at Bristol or at the, your current school now. Just first things that come to mind. Uh, I can kind of speak on that. So I go to, like I said, Roberts Wesley, it's upstate Rochester, New York, uh, predominantly white area. Outside skirts, more so in the city, is you know, uh, gritty type. But um, it's it, it's a uh, it can be challenging depending on how you are as a person. Um, I thought I was an extrovert, honestly, I really did. Uh, but when I when I got there, I became an introvert. I got stuck, you know, kind of looking at myself and you know, always feeling like an outcast. You're you're there, and you know, I'm someone who gets along with everybody, uh, no matter what color, what race, doesn't matter. But um, it's it's, it's, it's a little different, you know, uh, the school I go to is very heavily Christian people who have certain values. And um, I think with that, sometimes it can be a little difficult to get along or, you know, kind of see eye to eye on certain things. So it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, I think the biggest struggle that I've had, again, is just, you know, trying to go back to my old ways of just being vocal, uh, communicating with everyone. You know, I've uh, as I've been there these last two years now, I've, I've gotten, a, you know, gotten into a shell and just, you know, almost been that guy that didn't stand out anymore just because I didn't I didn't want people to speak on my name and not know me as a person. So I think that um, it is difficult, but, you know, it's oh, it's a growing and learning lesson. And, you know, it's just helping you in life, I guess you could say. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And that's, that's extremely important to hear. And as you go from one place where you're a little bit more extroverted to another an area where you're now feel a little bit isolated and, and you feel different from everyone else around you. It's very, very important to understand while you guys are journeying through, um, through this. Um, anybody else want to chime in about their experience? I was about to say, me really, I never really like, well, I went to Mount Pleasant, so it was like, it was like multi-race, like there was like plenty of different races in there. So it was like when I left Mount Pleasant in 2014, I went to URI before I even came to Bristol. So when I was at URI, it was like, it was hard for me to adapt because it was like, wasn't really in the nature, like, or a spot where I was comfortable. So 
I really just confined it in the, the, the certain amount of people that I didn't know. And that turned out to hurt me in the long run because I was afraid to get out there and make new friends because like somewhere like Zach said, it's hard when people speak on you and they don't really know you as a person. They just know what they see. So it was like, when I got to Bristol, I feel like everybody there just kind of like accepted me for who I was. So it was like, really at Bristol, I never really felt like it was hard or anything. I felt like that's where I needed to be. But like at big universities, like where Zach's at and you are right, like it could be intimidating because you're who you are and you've been who you are your whole life. And now for, like Zach said, he'd been there for two years, two years, the last two years of his life, he ain't felt like himself. So it's like, I understand where it could be intimidating and hard at certain times. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, yeah, just going off of what Telly and Zach have said, um, I really feel that, especially since I've just transferred to uh, UMass, I felt like just like I had to kind of contain like certain aspects of what I am and who I am and how I have certain beliefs and what I wear, especially. I feel like people don't understand that because they haven't had as much as a cultural experience or understood where I've come from. People have lived in predominantly white areas and they come to this school and they still have those same type of morals and they just aren't, they aren't aware of like the different types of cultures and certain things that people wear. They just see it as a more of a degrading look like they're not an, into, an, uh, an intellectual. They see us as people who just got lucky or have athletic abilities and got looked at from that point of view. To piggyback on what Malik's saying, I didn't really even think about it like that until he said it, but it made me go back and think about what I was just speaking on. My whole life, I lived and I grew up in a, like a, like I was saying, a multi-race community where I'm not really seeing that many whites or that many white families. So it was like when I went to URI, I was used to a certain way of living how I was in my environment. When I got taken out of my environment and put in that environment with people who didn't look like me and didn't act like me, it kind of put me in a reserved situation in it. And like I said, it intimidated me. Mm. Others? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm gonna go to the next part here. So let, let's talk about that acclimation. Um, let's think about your first year on, on a college campus. Um, you're stepping on on, a, on the campus and you're a little different, right? So you realize you, you, you realize that you may be an athlete or you may be you know one of how many students of color in your classroom. Um, talk about that a little bit of like what did you what were the first things that came to mind while you were while you were sitting there in that classroom for the first time? The first thing that came to mind my mind was, Nope, you broke up a little bit. I'm going to go sit in the back and I'm not even going to speak. And anybody who knows me know that's not me. Mm. I said the first thing that um that came to my mind was that I'm going to go in the back of the classroom and I'm going to sit in the back at all. So it was like, I just really wanted to stay reserved and out of the way. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Yeah, so for me, it's like, it, it almost sounds like weird, like even saying this, like when I first got there, like you look at me, like you're like, you guys know me, so you know how I am. But when I first got there, I was hearing like, oh, like, yeah, like, you know, people think you're attractive, but they're afraid to talk to you or, you know, like all these guys already said this and that. And it's like, uh, like, no, no, no one knows me. Uh, you know, like it's my first year there. I'm the new guy. Um, you know, how can you have this? this idea of me or, you know, this concept of who I am. It's like, it's just frustrating. I, I never understood it. Uh, I was never raised to judge like that. Um, so it's definitely difficult. And like Telly said, that's the type of stuff, like when you hear it and when you see it and it's so visible and like, it's clear to you, you start to act a sort of way. Like when I walk in class, you know, I'm going right to the back. I'm, I got my headphones on. 
and her hoodie on, whatever. Like, I really don't want you to see me, honestly. Others? Well, you have Malik to add to that from Big. my experience, um, right? Because, <laughs> yes. So, uh, I, you know, I was in um, my English was in my first language because I already felt like I had a disadvantage than other kids. I tried not to shine as much as I should have shined or not as much as I should have speak up, not raise my hand because I didn't want to sound and look different. So it's kind of like, you know, it was like everybody else said, I'm just going to go to the back of the room, sit in the back, not trying to spoil other kids while they're all hanging out after classes and making plans. And, and, you know, me just feeling like I'm, I'm different, not part of this social group. I didn't want, you know, I just it kind of kind of hesitated a lot. So that's why, like, the basketball team was like a safe zone for me. I could be myself there to where in class I couldn't be because it's just I just felt, you know, I'm not from the, this country originally. Right. So my culture is already different. I might have an accent. They might make fun of me because of my accent. I might be judged for different things. So there's different things that's going through my mind. So it made me feel like. I almost didn't belong there, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, so that, that to me, that was that was the difficult part of it. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so um, for me, I think it would be just I just like everyone else has said, I didn't really want to be noticed. So for me, even like answering questions in class, like if I was to get chosen out of however many students, it just put me in an awkward position because I never wanted to really be wrong and I didn't want to hear like anyone try, anyone judge me just off of my answers. I felt like that was just, that was probably my only thing as of now, just kind of staying to the side and not being noticed. Well, thank you so much for that as well. Uh, Malik, you had something to add? Yeah, so I was just going to uh, explain. I feel like my experience coming into BCC, I wasn't like, I didn't feel that singled out for that long because coming into BCC in high school, I feel like I had more of the single out feeling and being like isolated and having to like keep myself in my shell. You know what I mean? Because of me. So on the, the basketball team at, at uh, Bishop Stang, that's where I went to high school. The basketball team was... I was more of like a bigger person and just that, that mindset of being like a big guy on the high school team, you know, that played into a lot of like my personal decisions and like everything that I did throughout my days, just because I felt like basketball was such a big part of my life. And I was always thinking about it and what I had to do and what I was responsible for. So like that mentality, then going right into BCC, I know you guys remember, I got dunked on so bad going into BCC. First game, it was like the first 10 seconds I ever stepped on the court at BCC. And all my, like, my confidence, I'm not even going to lie. Yo, it was gone. I got dogged on. The gym was loud. Oh, my God. That was, that was one of the most craziest moments of my life. But, like, I am so thankful that that happened. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so – and, like, the fact that, like, I think that's, like, I have that on video, too. Man, that's, like, one of the, one of the funniest stories from, from BCC. Just – just an example of like one of the lessons and just like an eye opener, just like an eye opener of how things, how things are different. And from there, I realized that I wasn't alone as far as like dealing with stuff like that, because it wasn't, it's not even like that effect lasted that long from that. Cause I ended up going in and I forgot about it within like the second half, but like obviously after the game, we talked about it and the whole rest of the season, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much my piece. Anybody else that hasn't chimed in want to share anything? Or? So looking at what was just said, so. No, nah, hold on, hold on, hold on, Coach D. My bad, my bad. Um, one thing I wanted to say on that too, I felt like at, um, with my experience at URI, the teachers wasn't as caring and they didn't, they didn't really care as much as like at BCC. Like when I was at URI, I was in a math class, my first math class I ever took at URI. And I answered the question and I was wrong. And the teacher said to me, he said, um, you should think before you answer the question. I never went back to that class. 
You know what I'm saying? And like that's why I, I say Aang is my favorite teacher, not because he knew me outside of the classroom. It's because like when you're in the classroom with Aang, every single one of Aang's classrooms that I've been in, he makes sure that everybody's a part of the classroom. Like no matter if if it was me, somebody who he talked to every day, or it was the person who was like me that was sitting in the back on the other side of the classroom, like he showed you that he cared and wanted to see that you made something of yourself. So like, that's why I would like, even when I go back to finish school, I'm coming back to BCC. Like I didn't get my degree, but I'm coming back. <laughs> Love to hear that. So here, here's the thing that I wanted to get into. So we, we, we spoke about our experiences and um, sometimes feeling in the class that, you know, you know, some of it, some of you were intimidated in the classroom, uh, you, regardless of your stature, um, we heard that, you know, some people had these ideas of who you were, whether you be an athlete or, um, you know, you know, your, there was assumptions because of your height or your athletic build and, and thought process. We heard that, you know, individuals that, you know, in that classroom um, was afraid because of some of these, these thoughts or ideas of who you are. You didn't want to, you didn't want to ask, you didn't want to say the wrong answer in the class that, because that can be intimidating because you feel that there's these um, preconceived thoughts and, and about who you are as, as an individual. And we also heard that, you know, your, your culture is a little bit different and how you dress versus when you go to a school and people look different. Now you all come from different high schools. Um, some of you, um, Malik mentioned he came from a private high school. Um, so he felt that his acclimation was um, a lot smoother, a lot, you know, from Bishop Stang to um, Bristol. But some of you have come from inner city schools, some pretty tough schools, New Bedford High, Taunton, uh, Mount Pleasant, um, you know, um, Pro um, East Providence. Um, these are, you know, schools that are, you know, that are, you know, pretty prevalent in our areas and they, they're all a little bit different. Um, we've also, TJ, I believe you went to, can't remember the name of the private um, school that you went to, but you had experience in both. So can you talk about how much of a difference that is? Does that have something to do with the, the um, does that have something to do with the acclimation uh, that you are with the school? And, and did that hinder your progress from transitioning from that high school to um, the college, regardless of what college it was, in Bristol or, or, the, or another school some of you have been to? And um, how different is that, your high school to, to college? Everything's different from high school to college. My back for you, my back. I'm trying. I'm trying to get my my saying and audio. Nah, go ahead, go ahead, brother. But it's all good. I felt like um, I felt like everything was different from high school to college. Like, I went to Mount Pleasant and I didn't feel like like honestly, I say like I think back on it, I don't really even remember doing a lot of work. Like they gave you the work, but I personally don't remember doing a lot of work. I was getting by due to basketball. You know what I'm saying? So it was like when I got to college. It was none of that. I had to make sure that I was doing the work and I was handing the stuff in. And at times, since I wasn't used to that, like through high school and stuff like that, I would fall behind. And that was causing me, like my first year, I failed off the basketball team because I wasn't on top of what I needed to be on top of. So it was like, and even with like freedom, like when you're in high school, you got your parents there. Like every day I got out of school, my mom was asking me, do you got homework? Do you got this? Regardless if I told her the truth or not, she was asking. When I was in college, I don't have that. It's really all up to you and all up to the individual itself to go home and, and do the stuff that they need to do to make sure that their grades are where it needs to be. So I feel like from high school to college is a big difference. Clayton? Uh, so for, for me in high school, um, I, I went to the Bethel High um, and um, I, I was in a bilingual program you know, until my, my junior year. So uh, we were kind of sheltered, right? So when you're in a bilingual program, you have certain classes that you're taking, so you're not with the, you know, with the rest of the, of the students in the school. So, you know, when I'm bilingual program, I fit in. And then my father was alive at that point, so, so he helped me a lot with my schoolwork and getting to know the English language and things like that. So high school was a little bit easier for me. Uh, my senior year of high school, going into college, that was a tough year, right? So I lose my dad my senior year. Um, I'm now I'm not in a bilingual class no more, right? So now I'm 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 out with the with the rest of the, the group in the school. So I kind of became an introvert, you know. And then 
not knowing if I'm going to go to college, right? Because I had nobody to push me to go to college. And I had, you know, I, I had you and, and Phil that helped me make that decision. But I had nobody at home to help me make that decision, you know? So when I got to college, I was, I was already in the show. And then being there and then, been, you know, two years out of, you know, ELS, which is the, you know, the bilingual program, I didn't feel comfortable in college. So that, that, was, that was very difficult for me. Um, and I think that transition from senior year to college was definitely a very, very uh, difficult part of my life. Thank you. Yeah, um, I got something to say. I didn't know what um, Clayton said. I actually went to Bedford High School as well. And um, I think it's a major difference because in high school, it was just a breeze for me. Like, everything was easy. And, um, like, you know, I played sports. And, like, high school, like, to be completely honest, under Bedford High, you didn't really have to have good grades to be on the team. So, like, like, we, we was very capable of doing it, but I just felt like our time, we wasn't focusing on that. It was basically just sports and all that. And then I actually went to, like, a private college. It was um called Mount Ida in Boston. And I just felt like I was just way behind. Like, I went, it's, it's just so different. When I went there, it was just, I'm not going to even lie, I felt like I was dumb. I felt like, you know, like, I felt like my high school didn't prepare me for that. So, I mean, um you know, like, I definitely – um you know, I, like I dropped a lot of classes and everything. I had to take like certain classes to be able to be in, you know, the class with everybody else. And it was just tough, man. Like just making that transition is tough. And I feel like, you know, like certain high schools really don't prepare, um, you know, people to go to college. And that was basically my high school. And, you know, it was kind of tough to transition. And then I actually left that school. It didn't work out. And then BCC was my second my second school and like honestly I'm not even gonna lie I didn't really want to be there I felt like so out of place you know it was my second school I really just wasn't feeling it but I just stuck with it and you know I just didn't quit and it just worked out for me but it's definitely a major difference from high school to college so that's what I had to say thank you anybody else want to chime in uh yeah for high school high school for me I it kind of prepared me but since I played so many sports, teachers gave me a lot of leeway, which I feel like hurt me overall because teachers in college, they don't give you as much leeway. They're not going to be on your back telling you, oh, like, make sure you have this assignment done. Make sure you have that assignment. If you don't have the assignments, it's a zero. Like in high school, I would slack off just a little bit and they'll be like, oh, you can pass the assignment in later. I know you have a game. I know you have practice not in college it's a completely different element and I went to a, a pretty big school in high school I went to Taunton High and they just if you were decent at sports or they knew your name they give you a lot of leeway but in college they never do that even if you're in a if you're in a sport or not depend it doesn't matter what are some of the um, obstacles you had to deal with while going into school from your you know, your neighborhoods or your areas and things that people may not know that would be valuable for people to hear on this call? Well, for me, going from, from high school to college, right? Just like I said, I lost my dad, my senior year high school. My mother lives in Cape Verde. I had a younger brother that I had to take care of. Um, my father owned the house um, and my stepmom and I wouldn't really see eye to eye after my father passed away. So I was paying half the mortgage. While I was trying to go to school, play basketball, um, had my first daughter as well around the same time frame as well, so trying to provide for a family. So I, I was struggling with a lot. So, you know, going to classes, I was always was tired um, and also feeling up, feeling in and the English language not being my first language as well. And that's and ended up happening. I ended up feeling English class, right? Because I, I, the teacher, me and the teacher didn't connect as well. I was showing up to class every day doing the work, but it wasn't to the standard that he liked and there was no help offered. So I was struggling a lot and it, it, you know, it took me, it took me some time to get adjusted to, to the new life. Cause I had, I've gone through a lot. Mommy. Sorry, that's my son. <laughs> my, my wife is in a school meeting with for my other kid and they, they joined me in the car. <laughs> See me come home and that was it. Uh, so yeah, so it, it took me some time. Yeah, that's good. 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 Yeah, that's from senior year to, to college, the first year in college was definitely very tough for me. You know, just, I was there for a lot in my life and you know, I didn't, I didn't communicate that much as well, as well, you know, because I didn't, I didn't know how to communicate, you know, so I didn't know how to seek for help either. So I felt like I just had to do it on myself and figure it out. 
Um, so, so that was a that was a very tough tough time. Yeah, I could imagine you know losing your your father, your mom being in a different country, learning a language, trying to pay for a house, trying to play a sport, having a young child. I mean, I mean, and then trying to balance and learn a curriculum that is new to you. It, it's it's quite the quite the uphill battle, and to where you are today is it's unbelievable how how you've gotten through a lot of those things. Kudos to you. Um, Thank you. Others, things about your neighborhoods, things that you know, some of the obstacles you had to face while you were in while you were uh, you know in school or currently still facing. So, like me, when it, like with me, I felt like I felt like. Every year with me, it was like when I was trying to go to school at BCC, I had something going on in my life that was pulling me away and, and, and taking my focus off on a tangent from where it was supposed to be. So like, and Coach D could vouch for it. So like my first, um, my first year at BCC, I was dealing with like a lot of, um, I didn't know how to control my, my anger and like my temper and stuff like that. So I would just like, even basketball practice or what being a multicultural center or like anywhere I am on campus, if like, something didn't like if it if it got to me a certain way or I didn't like how things was going like I wasn't able to do what I'm able to do now like calm myself down and remove myself from a situation my first year it was constantly snap 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 and it was like I would never made it through that year or none of my years and, and got to where I'm at now it was like coach D played a big part of that like there was a point in time where a lot of people don't know like me and coach D went to a counselor like he went and sat down in the counselor room with me like we did a couple meetings like to help me and figure out what I needed to get through. Um, my second year, well, I ended up um failing off the team or whatever. I came back, I didn't apply myself how I should have. So um I ended up dropping out and I um I was working or whatever. The whole time I'm communicating with Coach D, I end up coming back. My my next year back, I'm working on my grades to get back on the basketball team. But at this time, it was like 2017 at that time, I was homeless. Like, I wasn't really, like, I wouldn't consider myself really homeless because I had a place to stay, but it wasn't a place of my own. I was living with my um my grandmother. So it was, like, and every year I was at BCC, I never had my license. I didn't have a car, so it was always the commute was dependent on other people to get me up there. So if I had an 8 a.m. class and somebody from Rhode Island who was going up there didn't have an 8 a.m. class, nine times out of ten, I was missing that 8 a.m. class. So it was, like, I was dealing with that. And then my last year, I lost my grandmother. Like once things started getting on a on a on a up and up for me, like I finally got into my situation, my living situation situated. I was back in school. I was able to control my temper. I was I was focusing on my grades. I had to um appeal. Actually, that year that I went back, I had to um appeal my fa- financial aid. They took my financial aid, so I had to go through the appeal process to appeal my financial aid. They let me back in. I'm doing good. Then I end up losing my grandmother. I lost my grandmother. The day after Thanksgiving, 2018, so we end up losing in the um the playoffs. The basketball team we end up losing in the playoffs, and it was just it was too much going on for me at the time. So I just never went back to school. You know what I'm saying? And like, I know that wasn't the the best thing to do because I had people there who I could have confined it in and um got you know what I'm saying got helped and the help I needed to move me along. But I made a I made a bad decision and I just never went back to school because I had too much going on in my life and I wasn't able to. I didn't want to go back to my old ways, the old telly, where I'm just snapping and not able to control what was going on in my life. So I just needed to. No. But that's that's somewhat of, of what I went through at BCC. Yeah, thank you so much. Anybody else? We got to transition soon, so I just want to get another. Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I'll chime in a little bit. Yeah. So for me, my situation, um, my mom has always been there for me, and she's always helped me out. And I just felt like it was time to help her out and give her like a reason or hope just to let her know that her work that she's put in with me is actually doing something because she's a single parent. She's all uh, she has me and my little sister. So I ended up going to BCC. I didn't apply to any schools out of high school. I was assuming that I was going to just join the military and do that. And it kind of went a little downhill because she didn't want me to, my mother didn't want me to join. So I ended up coming to BCC and Coach D helped me out. He got me situated and I ended up playing for him. I um, 
had three jobs at the time while being on the team and uh, continuing with my, my education. And Coach D was just always there. He always had me on a good schedule. So I think that actually helped me, honestly, because I probably wouldn't have went to school if I didn't end up talking to Coach D at the time that I did, because I didn't apply for any colleges uh, out of high school. Thank you, Malik. Any, anybody else? I want to pivot this last question because I know we're, we, you know, we can go, and again, we'll continue these conversations as, as these, as we build. And I really appreciate your, your um, honesty and, and how you guys are sharing with, with everyone here. What are, as we, as we pivot to the next part of this, what are some of the things that you think when you're going to a college that can help you kind of just get into the rhythm of college? Like what could you know, Bristol do better when you first get to campus or your other colleges? What are some of the things that you would like to see more of that will help you in your education journey and your processes as you're going, as you're doing this? With this being a different world and you, you first step foot on Bristol or any other school, what are some of the things that you think could help you um, get to your goal? Anything that comes to mind. My bad, coach. You broke up on that. Um, when you was ending the question, what was it? So as you're, so I'm looking for ideas. When you first go onto campus, what are things that Bristol professors, teachers, staff members, um, or you know, at Bristol or any college, you know, some of you guys are at different places. What are things that that school can do to help keep you there and help you enjoy your journey and be part of that? educational ride that you guys are that you're experiencing things that you would think of things that you think would be helpful for you um, as you're getting acclimated to this new environment i really feel like more things like like this or like more workshops like that can help students like obviously the, the, the students coming from high school to college to learn how the college atmosphere really is like how you just get the syllabus and you got to pay attention to the syllabus and you're not going to get notified when you got stuff to turn in and stuff like that. Like, I really feel like just getting them ready. Cause like, like John was saying, some high schools ain't preparing students for what they need to, when they get to the next level. So I don't, I feel like, and like, even with like, sometimes when kids go to schools, they just give them classes. They don't really figure out what's the right classes that that student really needs to help stimulate their mind and help them really, just excel in general. That yeah, I, I was also gonna say, like you know, um, I think like having a good counselor, a uh, guidance counselor that works with you, uh, I think that's like very important. Um, I'll compare like Bristol to where I'm at now. Um, ne neither of them are uh, are bad, but I guess the, it just like the level of care that you see in one compared to the other. Um, I think that to me that means so much, like when you see that someone genuinely cares to help you, um, you know, they're emailing you left and right. And I understand that it's college. So, you know, they're not going to go out of their way to do something, you know, crazy. I understand that. But I think it's just that, that passion that you see in them and that level of care that they have for you to be successful. I think that is like, it's important when you first get somewhere, especially just having that figure that you can go to no matter what. Uh, I think that's like one of the most important things. I think it's important to, um, to to see people that have been in the same shoes as us, someone like Coach D, you know, like people that we can kind of relate to more, people that, you know, just been in the same situation as us that we can kind of just build with and everything, you know, like get advice from and, you know, people who genuinely care. That's what I think. Anybody else? Yeah, I think just consistency, right? Um, I think that goes a long way because I think from from different teachers, you're, you're getting, you know, say you can, it could be the same English class, but the teacher makes the class, you know. So, you know, as I said, I failed my first English class and the teacher could care less. You know, I was asking for help and he was like, well, you need to do it this way, this way. But he didn't tell me if there was other venues that could go ask for help to help me write the paper. Right. Um, to where my, my second year, when I, when I had a different teacher, she was more caring. She was like, okay, all right, you did this paper, but I need you to rewrite it this way because you're, you're switching these words up. It was more, it was more, she was more 
in tune with, you know, she, she actually thought instead of, hey, hey, this is the assignment, turn it in, this is the date, I don't care, you know, about anything else. So it's just like, I'm going to work with you so we can get you to that point. We are here now and I want you to get there. I think that's what's missing uh, in the school system is, is that is that passion for the teacher, right? Instead of just like, I know, you know, I have 30 kids and you can't reach out to everybody. I understand that. But if you see somebody that's struggling, that's asking for help, don't don't turn away and be like, hey, I have all the students to worry about. Even if you can't help, it's definitely, you know, work studies, study halls, tutors, point me in the right direction or, or you know, that I could go ask for help. That I think the consistency there, I don't think you'll have it across with all the teachers in school. And I, I've noticed that going from BCC to Worcester State University as well, it was the same thing. This, you know, it, it, I think there's more needs to be more involvement in teaching instead of just here, his assignment, turn it in. Thank you for that. Anybody else says we're, we're going to pivot here? I don't know if anybody wanted to chime in real quick. Yeah, uh, I want to say something about what Zach said like having counselors and people who really care. Like, I think my last year, my counselor was Marsha. And like, there was times where she would call and wake me up my sleep and really say like, where are you? Like, I haven't seen you all day. So there was days where I would wake up and be like, let me get to school because I know she's going to be calling me or Coach D is going to be calling me. So it's like just having people who, who generally care, like genuinely care and want to see you do good. That will help. Thank you so much for that. So uh, we're going to pivot again because we can keep going on and on. And this is great, powerful stuff um, that we're hearing in real time. And, um, you know, and these conversations will carry on and we will. We'll, but I want to get to our next phase and there's some Q&A and then kind of really develop what the what the next piece and future of this will, will look um, will go. And I want to really thank um, you young men for and gentlemen for, for joining and, 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 and being really um, open and sharing, uh, at least for this portion. And then as we, we'll get to some Q and A's that you guys will be, audience will be able to ask some questions to, um, to these um, great men that we have here today. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into, uh, there's a several, a couple of individuals here that, um, that I work with, that I'm friendly with, um, that, that are colleagues of mine and I can actually call them friends and I often will call and have uh, candid conversations with them about um, students and retention and success and um, and the one thing that we always was always a theme is relationship and and engagement building um, and something that we we often talk about is like our experiences um, when we were in college myself and Daryl were in the same college together so we were athletes um, at you know and played in the JUCO level and he was a football player I was a basketball player but all the things that a lot of our students um, that you hear about are going through, we experienced it as, as fellow athletes. Um, myself and, and, and Serge are coaches. We are both coaches and, and we went to the same high school and we, we understand coaching individuals and, and, and being at the same high school and the experiences of being in the same neighborhoods. And myself and Angan more professionally have met and, and we, we started Bristol at the same time and clicked right away as we talked about our experiences of what we do inside the classroom. And what I wanted to do is I didn't want to leave this conversation today without having a different perspective of how they are successful because the young men that are in this particular session and other young men that we've worked with um, from the black male experience have all prospered and have been very successful under the tutelage and the responsibility and the guidance of these uh, three great um, individuals here. And so I wanted to give them open the floor. This is only a couple of minutes. They're going to just talk briefly on things that they've done, because again, we want you as the listener to kind of learn and, and take some notes, um, whether you're a student or if you're an employee, um, if you're a community member, these are great, valuable things to talk about as far as relationship and, and engagement, and then it will really help you. And then we'll get back to Q, uh, questions and answers, which will open up to anyone, whether it be uh, these three men, um, or our panelists of students and, and, and alumni that we just spoke with. So I'll uh, open up the floor and we'll go to the next slide. And DT, the floor is yours. All right, hello everyone, how y'all doing? I just wanna thank the brothers for sharing their message. 
Um, just appreciate you all being so open, honest, transparent. So I want to be quick with this. So I want to uh, uh, just to be conscious of time. So just three tips I would like to give everybody. And the first one is never stop learning. And uh, with that one, I want to say for everyone that's on this Zoom right now, just listening, recognize that your presence matters. Being here right now is a part of you continuing to learn about various cultures. The young brother spoke about um, what it means to be feared as a young black male. That's what they was really saying when they got on campus, how people looked at them a certain way. And how does it feel to be uh, treated like a threat? Um, and, and, and I know some of you that are listening may not be uh, a person of color, and you may have felt that you couldn't be yourself on a college campus when you got there. How often do you share that story with students? How often do you tell them that you recognize that? that you, and, and then you have to continue to learn the things that they're going through. So don't just let this be your last form. Continue to read, continue to watch documentaries. You are not going to learn all of this about our culture overnight. So never stop learning. The second thing I'll say is just you have to free yourself from something and realize that you can't save everyone. And I want to be clear about that. Sometimes you are meant to water a seed that was planted by someone else. And sometimes you are meant to plant a seed. Not everything you say is going to grow in a student the moment you say it. But that doesn't mean you can't give them that seed right then. And then you send them positive vibes and you continue to help them as they can. But I, I, I don't want you to feel as if you, you, you have to save everyone. People, we There's other people that will come into folks' lives that will help them out at different stages of their lives if that's their journey. But know that your, your place in their life at that moment might be to plant that seed. The key is to know the seed that you're meant to plant and plant it well. And then the last thing I want to say is sharpen your strategies. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are coaches and uh, Coach Rob will tell you about this. Uh, my friends used to uh, say this as, as, high, as college coaches, uh, that we get older as coaches, but all of my players are traditionally 18 years old no matter how much older I get, right? When they come into college, they're going to be 18. And so what he said to me is that he constantly has to change his approach when he's talking to 18-year-old students because as he gets older and older and older. And I believe that's what we have to do is we have to realize that our, the strategies we used 10 years ago, we have to change those every so often because we're getting older, but the generations are different when they're coming up. They're as 18 years old. For the leaders in the room, I want you to think about situational leadership by Blanchard and Hershey in 1969 when they talked about the ways of adjusting your management style to adapt to each situation. So think about that. And that's just what they're saying is not one size fits all. Another way we can really look at it, uh, what, what the students were saying about sharpening your approach is just caring for the students as well. Uh, a lot of students talked about just caring for them. So think about that and how much you actually uh, genuinely care about the student and think about it in this way. Have you ever purchased a home before and had to change real estate agents? And you, you spent the same amount of money, down payment, all of that stuff, but the different agents felt different when you were working with them. You felt like one was just trying to sell you a house and you might've felt like the other was really working in your favor, front loading information for you. That's what it means when these students are saying, who cares about me? Who? What does it feel like when I come to your office? Are you just sending me down the line? Does it take several steps before I can get to a green check on my phone and technology? How does it feel when I'm in your space and you're talking to me? So continue sharpening your strategies, everyone. Continue learning and all of that. And, uh, and, and we're going to do this together. So that's my little piece today. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was unbelievable. I appreciate that um, perspective. Uh, Serge. All right. Thank you for those tips, DT. That's all great information. And uh, thank you to all the, uh, the young men who were speaking. Your, um, your insight is valuable to everyone in the room, uh, including each other as you, as you guys are going on your journeys. So um, some of the key points that I always try to hit, number one is caring. So. I know it sounds cliche, but listen to the room, right? Telly, Zach, John, Clayton, they all mentioned someone either 
feeling like someone cared or feeling like someone didn't care. And so um, caring has to be at the top of that. Um, our students just have to feel like we care about them. And um, as Telly describes his, um, his um, interactions with Angan, it's not because Angan said, I care about you, Telly. He did it through his actions, made him feel welcomed in his, in his space. And, and that's what's important. Um, respect is huge because we, um, as adults, demand a respect from students that we don't always automatically give them. And, and so you have to understand that it's not just your space, it's their space too. And so they deserve a certain level of respect to not be treated as um, less than because they're not equal to you. Uh, this is their space too. So respect is huge. They have to feel like um, you're going to treat them appropriately, right? Um, trust is incredibly important as well because these, these young people are gonna come to us for advice. They're gonna seek counsel. They're gonna um, just wanna have conversations with you. And so if they don't trust you, how can any of this happen, right? They have to always feel like whatever you say or do, they have to believe even if they don't like what they're hearing or what you're, what you're um, asking of them, that they believe you have their best interest in heart. And so they'll, they'll always trust you. Um, and then of course, conversations, right? Why do I know, um, I'll, I'll use my own students. Why do I know Hugh is changing up his leg workouts? Why do I know Abdel has a, a workout on, uh, on Friday or his first volleyball game of the season is coming up? How do I know Emmy works at Chipotle? Because I have conversations with them. We're so focused on our uh, curriculum or content that we forget to just be human with our students, right? And these conversations are huge and, and we have to get to know our kids, get to know uh, where they come from, understand their lives outside of our, our classrooms. And um, I always listen to like YouTube videos and things like that when I'm getting ready for work in the morning. And today I was listening to an interview with Dave Chappelle and he talked about how the entertainment industry will, um, will make you feel like a lion that's chained to a folding chair, but you don't know that you can just walk away. It's just a folding chair, right? And so education can do that to us also where we feel like we're chained because we have systems and protocols that have to be followed. And we're, we're so focused on, on doing these things that we forget to just build relationships with kids. That's, that's what it's really all about. Again, same, same reference as the basketball piece. We don't coach because we love the game. We coach because we love kids. And so hopefully through our coaching efforts, we give them something that they can use as they go along in their, in their lives. And so, um, and use Rob's uh, five areas of uh, gaps, right? Engagement, inspiration, relationships, motivation, and belief. Like DT, DT seems like a super high energy guy, right? So motivation might be easy for him. Whereas I'm a low energy guy, but relationships come easy to me. I love just talking to these kids. So use those to your, to your advantage. And remember that they all, they all blend together. So if you're not good in one area, that's all right. If you're, if you're really focusing, you're gonna get there and make that, that gear come together and, and just um, understand too, kind of what DT alluded to at the end. You're not always gonna get it right. We, we could try to, we're blue in the face and sometimes we just not everything for every kid the way we wanna be and that's okay. You just keep doing your best. Thank you so much. That was great as well. Um, Engen? Hi, everyone. My brain is boiling now. There's so much to like wrap my head around, but uh, I'm going to echo some of the suggestions that our speakers have made. Um, I think we need to change our conception of what school and education is for. You know, we're often too obsessed and assumed with the idea that you know education is about knowledge and transferring of information uh, it's beyond that right it's it's more than just knowledge it's also about our ethical responsibility to people that we work with mm -hmm. so the institution of education is is bigger than just the knowledge that it's been it's producing uh, it's about relationships it's about the social emotional piece so with that in mind i i always say you know you have to give to get you know, uh, the, the conditions that Serge uh, outlined about caring and love and respect and trust, uh, you need to give that out first to be able to receive it. And I, I have a strategy of doing that. I, I call it the, the relational vulnerable me, and it could work for you as well. It worked well for me over the years. 
and I'm, I'm somewhat of an odd ball. You know, I'm originally from Turkey and here I am talking and commenting about race relations in the United States. So that's kind of like this, this ambivalent space that I occupy. And I, I use that space in the classroom as well. And I understand that's some, somewhat of a privilege for me to be able to freely talk about really controversial issues in the classroom. But when I do talk about these issues, uh, I usually present myself as not the expert, or I don't really uh, put myself out there as this untouchable, you know, uh, expert who is undeniably the, 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 the messiah of social justice education. I try to put myself out there as Angin. I mean, as Telly would tell you, I'm his dog. I'm his, I'm his guy. <laughs> hey, you know you're my dog. I'm, I'm your dog, yeah. I try to be vulnerable. I, I try to come off as someone who is also as insecure as they are and who is someone as curious as they are and that I'm not an know-it-all guy, right? Even though I have that title, I have a PhD, I am doctor so-and-so, I don't use that a lot. I, I try to be just Engin so we can become co-narrators of this, this journey, this narration of knowledge and, and learning and socializing, which is my second point. Uh, I do try to socialize and have conversations. That's probably why I know most of the students that are not even in my program. Uh, we try to have daily conversations. I try to hang out where they hang out, which I think was one of the points that a lot of our speakers have made we need more spaces where students can just socialize and be themselves. And we need more faculty members to be involved in those spaces to create those moments where they can learn about their students, learn from their students. That's where you begin to deconstruct a lot of biases and assumptions that you might have. I know Tally shows up late. I don't get mad because I know why. <laughs> I know exactly why. Um, so th that, that's the relationship right there, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, of course, the curriculum and instruction piece, right? When we teach, I, I call it experiential, but you can call it whatever you want, inclusive, diversified, equity, all these terms that you can use. I like the term experiential because it speaks to uh, the, the, the tradition of John Dewey, where the content is, is meaningful. It's not isolated. It's not alien. It's not just sterilized, but it is meaningful in, in a way that is contextualized from the experiences of my students. Um, so I don't just teach dry, sterilized knowledge. I try to bring as much of my students' funds of knowledge and experiences into what I teach because I want to enlist them as valid, valuable sources of knowledge, right? So if you're teaching English, why not read something about redlining? If you're teaching statistics or mathematics, why not talk about income disparities? So there's all these opportunities where you can make your curriculum and instruction more meaningful. Uh, and I have students who have you know, taken the, the, the easy way out from my classes where they would go sit at the back. <laughs> and maybe Telly has done that too. And I remember the last class that he took with me, he sat in the front because um, I would not let them get away with that. You know, that's another piece, like the instruction piece. Move around, you know, proximity. If they're sitting at the back, then you go at the back and teach from the back, right? So those are my little insights, and I can go on forever, but th that's that's what I have for tonight. No, thank you so much, uh, Engin, for that. That's, uh, again, powerful. All three individuals, all three different levels of my relationships with them, all different levels in, in higher education, secondary education, and all powerful in just short, three quick, concise, things to take away that you should be able to utilize in your classrooms. As we go to this, uh, as we move on to the next piece real, you know, uh, again, we, I know we're wrapping up in time, but I wanted to get to a couple of questions at least, and I've seen some there and you have the opportunity to utilize the chat. If you'd like to ask a question to any of these um, fine young men or any of these practitioner teachers, leaders that are in their spaces as well, um, things that will help you um, uh, as, as a, um, educator or as a community member. Uh, we have representation here from various um, uh, council and, and also mayor offices and things like that. So any of you want to join in and chime in, please do so. We have alumni on here. Um, so even though it's not as robust as we've had in our last conversation, we have professors on here. This is probably the most diverse as far as different areas of people that are involved. Um, 
So I'll start with the first question and, um, you know, uh, you know, so I'll start with the questions and kind of go from there. And there's a few I have that are private. Um, so one is, um, it is to the young men um, that, that are on the panel it says, how much energy do you feel you have put into proving yourself, especially when it comes to education? Me personally, at times I feel like I drained myself because there was times I can't figure it out. Like my brother's a college graduate, so I will go to him and say he's not there. There's times where I just can't get it. So it's like a lot of the times where I feel like I gave it my all. So it's like, yeah. Anybody else? How much energy that you, again, I'll read the question again here. It just says, um, how much energy do you feel you have put into proving yourself, especially when it comes to education? Uh, I can speak. I can speak on that. I've been in, I've been in school for a while now, so I feel like I, you know, I've put in so much and in, in certain areas and certain places that it's like sometimes you just, you know, you want to give up. You want to give up. You wanna, you wanna make that excuse for yourself and take the easy route out instead of you know fighting through the adversity, and you know again through it and growing. And I mean, you know, it all depends how you look at it, how you approach it, and how you go about it. But um, if you let it consume you, it can definitely take over and be a, a, a challenge. Anybody else before we move on to the next question? All right, so I have the next question and this one is actually directed to you, Malik, um, Malik Charles. And it says, regarding uh, your experience in the military, um, how did that compare to your process of going to college? So my experience in the military, it definitely was an eye opener, just being like how college is so lenient and they don't really like give you as much as structure. In the military, there's always a structure. You're never not gonna know what you're doing throughout the day. Like when I was in boot camp, I knew I was waking up at 4.30. I knew I was getting dressed by 4.45 and I knew I'd be outside working out, running, doing et cetera, classes, courses, learning the history and the knowledge of military warfare. And it was just, it kind of just helped me like build a structure and be more um, persistent and know what I want to do and know what I have to do in order to get to where I want to get. Thank you so much. Um, next question uh, is, uh, what was the one fear you had when you began at Bristol? But what experience you encountered at Bristol eliminated that one fear? So what was the fear that you had and what got rid of that fear if you did get rid of it? Um, for me, it was really just, figuring out what I wanted to do, like what route I wanted to take, which classes I wanted to take. And honestly, Coach D, you eliminated my fear. <laughs> really, honestly, I, I could speak on a bunch of things and, and situations that I didn't been in and, and it, that made me look at things differently and, and think about things differently. And when I needed to clear my head in a clear view of that, you was the one that I, I really went to. So you helped get rid of most of my fears there. Yeah, I would say the same. I think for me, like my story, um, I just didn't I didn't think I'd be good enough, not even so much about just basketball, but just in general as a student um, coming into BC. I didn't really care about school. I had a I had went to Johnson and Wales right out of high school. Um, I was a student there. I walked on the basketball team, got kicked off and I just like stopped really caring and going to school. And um, the meeting that we had that summer prior to me going to Bristol was what, you know, what kind of changed me around, which made me, you know, want to focus. I told you my goals. I told you my ambitions. You know, I told you I wanted to be a scholarship athlete. Um, and you told me what it took. And it was just up to me kind of to, you know, make that happen at the end of the day. So I would definitely say uh, you helped me a lot in that. Thank you so much. Anybody else would like to chime in? 
What was it, fear, and what got rid of that fear? I think my, my biggest fear was, was feeling, right? Just feeling in general, because I'm going to something new um, to me, right? And, and not knowing what to expect um, since I was afraid of feeling. And that kind of helped me back uh, for, for a little while. But being part of the, you know, the basketball team and the study halls that, that you set up for, for, for all of us helped me get rid of some of those fears. But like, OK, I'm in, this, I'm in a room with athletes like myself. We're struggling. We could have conversations. Right. And we could learn from each other. So that helped me, you know, over time, get rid of the fear to where it's like, I, could, you know, go, I know where I could go to. Do, you know, I have that, that assistance. So that, that's my piece on that. One good case. Yep. Thank you. Next question here um, we have, have you ever been unsure about going to college? And this is um, for a student have wrote this in. So. Um, yeah, I, I feel like at this point, I feel like there's so much that you could do in the world that some people may feel like, like me personally, I feel like everybody should go to college and college is needed. But it's like, if you're like, say you go to college and you're not ready for college and you're just like, for example, me, how I was going through it. And I went to URI and I, and I, I got kicked out of there and, and how everything happened there. Like I'm in debt. So if you're not, this, this is what I tell like the younger kids that I know, like if you're not a hundred percent sure, if you're, if you're really ready and um to commit yourself and, Go to go JUCO. That would be my biggest thing. Go to a community college before you take your yourself to a, like an actual university. Mm. Clayton, you were saying something. Yeah. Um, so to me, with well, my story from high school to, to college, I was very unsure about going to school. Right? Yeah, I have a house I got to pay for. I have a kid on the way. I need to provide for my family. So I'm looking at school. I'm like, I need to get a job that pays me. School wasn't wasn't my first stop, you know. So if you if you and Phil didn't approach me, and I had people in the corner that approached me and kind of made me choose to go that route, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at now. You know, so definitely was very unsure about going to school at, at that time frame. But glad that I had people on my corner like yourself. You know, so thank you for that. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I actually wasn't even planning on going to college or community college. I was just planning on doing my four years, maybe extension in the military and living off of that because I knew like it'd be, I'd have a financial income that is consistent and it always come through and I wouldn't have to worry about anything. I'd have a living area and structure basically just for that <clears throat> i'm gonna move on to the next question because it's kind of very similar to that last one and then i'm gonna combine i'm gonna combine these two they're they're um, one's pro public and one's um, private but it says as black young men do you ever have you ever thought of leaving the country and never coming back because of the racial tension in the country so we're, we're talking about racial tension that are, that are happening right now um and then, so the, and the other part, so I'm combining the two. So this one says, you know, how do these, you know, topics brought up in the classroom make you feel? So it would be the classroom or it could be spaces like what we're doing right now as well. So kind of combining the two. What are your thoughts about what's happening right now in the country as, as young black men? I feel like um, obviously it's wrong but I feel like it, it's coming to light. You know what I'm saying? Like, every, what's the saying? Everything that's done in the dark comes to light. So, like, everything's just coming to light and forums like this and, and other people like celebrities and stuff like that who got platforms to get the word out and to make people come together. That's what we need more of. So, that's only my, really, my only insight on it because you can't, not one person is going to be able to change it. It's going to have to be everybody as one. Like, not just, not just a black man or, or a Chinese man or a, a white individual. Like, it's going to have to be every race and everybody on the same page. Others on it? I know this is a deep one, so. 
Well, I, I thought about leaving the country in, my, in high school, right? I'm like, well, get me back to Cape Verde, but I didn't have to deal with this at all, right? So I, I could fit in. Those are my people. Um, but but, but I'm, glad, I'm glad I stuck it through. I think um, in the country right now, I'm glad that this, this uh, social forums like this one, and we're actually talking about it, you know, up front now. So I think that it's a big step. It's that definitely have long ways to go to get to where we want to be. And just to, to, just a second, um, what Telly just said is I think every individually, we're going to have to change ourselves individually in order to change as a country. So if you, if you don't change yourself, you can't change the country. Um, I, and I take this, this line from, from Jay Cole, right? What's good at, at the oppressor gets oppressed for so long and then the oppressed overthrows the oppressor and then they become the oppressor at the end of the day. So if, if they don't change themselves, so you have to change yourself first before you could, you know, change the world. So that's, that's how I feel. You know, you just gotta be more acceptable about each other and, and learn from that. <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, chime in? So we're gonna we're gonna be uh, closing up here. I'm gonna do this last one. Based on your past higher education experiences, combined with what you know now, do you feel as more empowered and more confident being a black man in today's society? In society today, I would say um, definitely. Like, and I'm only and I'm only 24, so it's like with me having my own son. There's things that I want him to understand at a young age, and that I might have not understood at a young age. So it's like. I definitely do feel more empowered. Anybody else? Uh, Rob, I'd just like to add that the, the experiences um, outside of the classroom play such a big role because, you know, Telly's certainly a better man because he had an opportunity to know his brother, Zach, who, who also Mal Malik got to know and so Malik Morris is a better person because he had to, the chance to be around Malik Charles and right down the line. And then these brothers have a chance to know Clayton as former players who come back and always support the program. So these experiences outside of the classroom are so valuable as well to, to that component. Absolutely. Anyone else here? Uh, yeah, I definitely am. I definitely do feel empowered. Um, just the fact that once people do get to know me and they know how much I've achieved in my life and I'm only 22, they're, they're just shocked and they see that people are like, we are all people and we all have aspirations and goals. <clears throat> so just like me going to a four year university, being in the military, having all my stuff together and all these accolades that people find out once they get to know me. It just shows that all the hard work that I'm that pays off for me, they can honestly find that in other people as well that they don't know. And they don't just assume we're all not intelligent or we are all just trying to get by in life and not uh, excel in life. Absolutely. I, I feel like a lot of the things that we also learn from each other helped one another. Like, especially like with my teammates, like, when I was with them and, and, and learning things from them and the things that they've been through and that insight on stuff like that, like, that made me, like, like how Malik was kind of saying, like, the things I could find in him as a person, you could also find in somebody else. Like, you learn from everybody around you. And I think that's, you know, important to looking at college as one big team. And if we're all, you know, we take some of the tips that, you know, that we heard from DT Surge and, and Engen and from you, from you all, it's, you know, that sense of community and being part of a team and understanding that we're all, we're all different. We all have our differences and good and bad. And, you know, it, you know, whereas that, you know, T DT said, sometimes you just need to plant the seed. You don't need to water it. And sometimes I think if we as work together as a, as, as a community, the, these things can be accomplished. Um, you know, this is such a powerful um, display of, of energy, um, conversation. Um, I would like to, you know, give a round of applause to all the panelists. If you guys have the reaction buttons and can just, you know, 
really give it up to uh, these young men for um, giving, uh, spending the time to really talk about their experiences um, and, and being part of something that is much bigger than us. And we can't do it by ourselves. I think a lot of times we as, as, as professors, teachers, community members, we, we're left with that burden of trying to solve uh, you know, these issues on retention and recruiting and, and social justice and diversity, equity, and you know, all these different pieces that are, that are part of our cultures and our school systems and our communities. It's really, really tough to do. Today, we really brought everyone together to have a conversation to, to really start it and to also give some tips and continue and continue to build towards a greater, uh, a greater good. And that's what our work is. That's why we're, we work at tirelessly. But, you know, with our relationships, I, you know, in engagement, we have stayed connected with these men and I have a hundred others that I'm still connected to um, that we develop relationships with. And, you know, I've always had their backs and they have my back and, this is what you know. I think we all can do for one another. It doesn't matter, um, you know, who you are. If you build that relationship, have those conversations, show love, show, tr um, build trust. Those type of great things can happen for us um, as a community. So, what I'd like to do, if, if anybody had a, any quick comments that they would like to say to the young men, I'll open it up, and after that, we will wrap up right now. So, any quick comments for the for these uh, young men? You have anything to say you have the floor is yours if you want to throw it in the, in the chat because you're busy that's absolutely well uh, thanks for sharing from laura also from uh, mary says this was great uh, thank you robin listen a panelist so grateful to have forums like this thank you for sharing your stories um appreciate you so much uh, thank you for your time inspiration much appreciated thank you for taking time and sharing so you guys you young men are impacting and getting the love um, that you deserve from in there. I don't know if anybody uh, wanted to say anything. If not, we're going to wrap it up right now and I'll go into the next steps. Um, you know, and it says best luck in your endeavors. Thank you so much for sharing. So if you guys follow the chat, there's a lot there. So our next, our next thing is what are, what are action steps? What is next? So tomorrow, everyone on here will receive a um, newsletter in, the, in your email. Um, and then newsletter will be there. There are some action steps in, uh, in within that, uh, that newsletter, you're going to receive um, links to something like this. Melissa, would you like to take it away and talk real, real, real quick about what this is? Yeah, um, so I can't take credit for the additional readings. These were actually given to us by um, Ingen, but these along with a few others will be put in the newsletter tomorrow. Um, they're all just either, um, I can never say this word, ped pedagogy or other resources that you can use for the classroom to try to make your um, classrooms more equitable and give you tips and ideas to go by. Um, so the three I put here were the Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers, of African American children, um, teaching to and through cultural diversity and pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, so I will link those directly to um, Amazon books and different ways that you can uh, get your hands on these. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. As we wrap up the year, just wanted to uh, thank you all for being part of the Social Justice Forum. A lot of you that are on here, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys have been supportive. You've been here all year. I really, really appreciate it. Um, if you look at the 2020 to 2021 um, social justice year in review, um, we've had nine social justice forums um, and two fast action forums. So 11 total of these types of events. Um, we've had uh, 1,246 participants um, for the forum. That's not including today's numbers. Um, and then 795 have signed our pledge which is against racism, hate, and violence, which is on our website, which is pretty powerful in itself. Um, 511 subscribers to our newsletter right now. That's the current number of people who have subscribed and they're not unsubscribing. So the, the material is there. We've had 40 social justice newsletters that have been sent out and almost half of the people are opening them. So that's a good, that's a good thing, right? Sometimes people won't open up the, but there's a lot of great information in there. Uh, one thing I would like for us to understand is there will be another part to this black male experience as that black man, uh, as we go into part three, four and five and beyond. Um, but we will in the fall open up to our social justice forum and 
when we return, we will talk about the Latino male experience in the fall as well. So we will have both of them concurring and we'll have um, various students and athletes and individuals who have a different perspective from being uh, English as a second language or being from a, um, a different culture that is, um, or being Hispanic here in America and all. And so there, I can't wait to dive into that. And we will be doing that um, sometime in the middle of September of next year. So stay tuned for the date. Um, next slide, please. Just understand that we appreciate your time and effort. There will be a five minute survey that will be emailed tomorrow. If you could please fill up that survey and any perspectives or thoughts that you have, uh, we'd like to collect that data and build on it if you can. So that will be up there tomorrow. Next slide. Um, also, there will be information about stop um, racism and hate and violence. Again, Asian hate has been something that's been um, escalated over the last few um, since the pandemic and other things that we're seeing a lot of the protests and things that are happening. So um, please, again, uh, read you know the statements from President Douglas and others that have been part of this. Um, next. And then finally, you know, stay connected with us. Shoot us an email. Tomorrow we'll put emails of uh, individuals here if you want to contact any anybody. Um, all that stuff is in, uh, powerful and important. Um, any ideas you have or things that you, ideas for the future or you want to be part of this uh, growing uh, social justice forum and develop things, whether it be in your classroom or in your community, please reach out. Uh, we love to collaborate and do things in the future with you. And then also follow us on social media, um, which is our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook pages. Um, other than that, I really appreciate every last one of you. Thanks for attending. Uh, I know we went a few minutes over the 6.30 timeline, but I appreciate for you hanging on and staying there and you have a, yourself a blessed night. And gentlemen, thank you for being part of this great experience today. Bye everyone.